Welcome, Bent Riders around the world. My name is Gary Solomon, and you're watching the Laid Back Bike Report. I just couldn't be happier to have you all with us today for the show. Let me tell you what's on today's webcast. We're going to kick it off as usual with Hans Agala with uh, some recumbent news. Then we're going to uh, start one of our three uh, major guest segments. Really interesting stuff of uh, this month. We started off with our friend Barney Hall from the UK, and he's going to talk to us about human powered flying in the UK. We're going to then uh, drop uh, way down south uh, into the Pacific. Well, I guess Australia would be there. Uh, Steve Nurse is a uh, cycling author, and he has uh, recently published a book called Cycling Zoo. And we're excited to talk to Steve about that. It is mostly about recumbents. And uh, Steve has also uh, sent us a few books to give away. So, uh, just a heads up, if you would like to be entered into this giveaway during uh, the show at any time until we get uh, done with Steve's segment, uh, just type into the comments, either on Facebook or on uh, YouTube, hashtag zoo. If you just do hashtag zoo, all lowercase, you will be entered into the contest. We'll pick uh, a few winners uh, later in the show. Then uh, also from the UK, we have Alex Baines Buffery. Uh, he's an interesting fellow who home built uh, a two wheeled recumbent bike uh, that he calls Frank. Uh, so I think you'll be interested to see what, uh, what Alex has put together. Uh, back for a regular segment is our pal, the bicycle man, Peter Stull, and he's gonna show you how to fit a linear bike into a Honda Odyssey. Um, without removing any of uh, the center consoles. So that should prove interesting. Joseph Janning from uh, Germany, our Velomobile expert, is back with a review of Radical Design trailer uh, that he has attached to his Velos and shows you how he does the attachment and uh, kind of does a review of the trailer, uh, an interesting segment. And then we're going to finish it up with a viewer submission with a tracker who rode from Florida to Alaska. Really interesting, uh, a really interesting segment there. So, all right. Well, first, how about meeting our intrepid crew, the folks who make this show possible? There we go. First of all, uh, all the way from Salzgitter, Germany, it is Lars Kamm, our director today. Hi, Lars. Hey, guys. Nice to be here. And down in Jackson, Mississippi, it uh, it is our friend Trey Burgoyne who does the media. Hi, Trey. Hello, folks. Uh, we have uh, over in Champaign, Urbana, Illinois, Nina Paley, our retro futurist. Howdy. Hope it's not raining where y'all are. Thank you, Nina. And uh, in Alfred Station, New York, ensconced in his shop, it is the bicycle man, Peter Stahl himself. Hey, Peter. Hello. It's great to have you guys all with us. Thanks. All right. Let me talk briefly about how you can participate in this live webcast. If you're watching us right now on uh, YouTube or Facebook, just make a comment uh, and you can, uh, with that, tell us, please, where you are watching from. You can comment about the show, uh, any particular segment. You can chat with your fellow uh, Bent Riders uh, during the show. And uh, we would love to hear from you there. We'll pop a few of those up on the screen as the show goes on. If you're interested in supporting the Laid Back Bike Report, we would love that. So you can like us on Facebook. You can subscribe to us on our YouTube channel. And you can click that little white eye up there, take you right to the Laid Back Bike Report website. And uh, of course, one of the best ways you can support us is by becoming a Patreon. You can do so for as little as $1 a month. Patreon.com, just look up the Laid Back Bike Report. We'll talk more about that at the end of the show. Now, 
the supporters of the show include our wonderful audience and, of course, these amazing businesses and uh, industry uh, notables, including TerraCycle, makers of exquisite recumbent parts and accessories for your bent, and Trail Side Trikes, a fine recumbent trike shop on the Withlacoochee, on the Withlacoochee Trail uh, in Florida, and Cruise bike, designed for the cyclist who wants to ride farther, climb faster, and adventure more. All cruise bikes and frame sets ship free in the USA. And TerraTrike Green Speed, the best in leisure, performance, adventure, touring, electric, and portability. Wherever your adventure leads, TerraTrike will take you there. And Green Speed, where Ian Sims designs bring performance through science and engineering. And, of course, Laidback Cycles, the top USA dealer for TerraTrike and the premier source for CatTrike, Ice, and Green Speed. We give you the freedom to ride. And, of course, Recumbent CycleCon. Though we've postponed the 2021 Recumbent CycleCon trade show and convention, please join us on October 8th and 9th of 2022 at the Montgomery County Fairgrounds in Dayton, Ohio. More information at Recumbent CycleCon. Dot com. All right, folks, uh, let, is, let us jump right into the show with a news report from Hansa. Hansa couldn't be with us today live, but he did record this segment. So, L Lars, let's have a listen. Hello, everybody. Hansa Galaf from Recumbent.news here. Last month, uh, Terra Trike has introduced their new Evo Trike. The Evo stands for electric vehicle option and it is their electric assisted trike. It did have a Bosch active line plus motor but this time they have improved the motor and they chose the Bosch performance line and they still have the four 400 watt hours battery. So it is a very nice trike electric assisted you can go to their web page you can check the availability there. I have also published three articles about new types of velomobiles. Uh, some people doesn't like to call them velomobiles, some call them light electric assisted vehicles or just like electric uh, vehicles. Doesn't matter, I see them as uh, practical bikes for, the, uh, bikes for daily life. And uh, this time all of them are four-wheelers, two of them are two-seaters. And based on what I see on my webpage on the recommend.news, every time I, uh, I publish an article about such vehicle, it uh, brings a lot of interest. Uh, people are very interested and I hope that we really will see the momentum turning into something real, something what we will be able to buy, uh, to purchase, and we will start to see these kind of vehicles on the streets. So, this time it was the, the AQ Hawk from Poland, from a company from the Pima uh, Velomobile, the company producing the cab bikes at the moment. The second one was the Gallop E from Accurat Lohmeyer, which is just a single seater and not m very much information about, uh, about it. And the last one is a beautiful one, a side-by-side -side tandem two-seater four-wheeler Kinner from Finland. This is very worth to watch. There is a video as well. Uh, it is in a prototype stage as well. But I really hope that these three will come to production sooner or later, the same as the others. So this is all from me for today. Uh, have a nice evening. Uh, have a nice rest of the laid back bike report and See you in a month latest. Bye-bye. 
Thank you, Hansa. Appreciate that. All right, guys, we're going to move on to our uh, first guest segment in just a second. But I'm seeing in the live chat here, some of you are uh, entering the contest. And when I meet, when I say hashtag zoo, Lars, could you share my uh, zoo screen so people can see? Right. So it needs to actually be that hashtag and then all in lowercase zoo. If you've already typed it in just type it in again it only takes it will only take it one time so no sense uh, repeating that but if you haven't done it this way go ahead and uh, and enter it in this fashion i just want to make sure you guys if you're interested have a chance so all right Lars, back to me and i think uh, at this point i'm going to quickly introduce our first uh, guest segment it's actually barney harl who is uh, with the british human power club and has recently gotten involved with human powered flight there in the UK. I think you're going to really enjoy this uh, segment. So Lars, let's, let's see Barney's video. I am here with Barney Harl in the UK and Barney is an esteemed member of the British human power club. Barney, how are you doing today? Fine. Not only the British human power club, Gary, but now I'm also a member of the British human powered flying club. And I'm so glad you mentioned that because that is what we're going to be talking about. This is the departure for us at the Laid Back Bach Report. And who better to guide us through this than Barney? So, Barney, if you are ready, why don't we go ahead and get to your presentation and let's let's see what this is all about. So, thanks, Gary. Yeah, I mean, human-powered flight, it's um, something many men have dreamed of. And the history of this goes back to the, the, the successful history. This goes back to the 1960s. Uh, the first ever human-powered flight was an aircraft called SUMPAC. Uh, SUMPAC stands for Southampton University Man-Powered Aircraft. Uh, quite a, a, a wonderful piece of engineering for the 60s. Um, if anybody's interested, there's a fabulous YouTube video of this, which is classically British and I think highly entertaining. Uh, it was flown in 1961, first time, by... Uh, a flying instructor called Derek Piggott. Um, I think we've got Derek on the next photo, haven't we? Oh, th this is this is how Derek loads into some pack. Um, and initially, his role had been to train young, fit cyclists how to fly. And they found it easier to train Derek how to pedal hard than it was for Derek to train cyclists to fly. So Derek actually did it. He was the first man to do great success. He was airborne for about 20 seconds. Um, I think the next one should. Here he is, posing by the machine, a, a great British character. And many, many of today's pilots still have a laugh. And his name is still much vaunted in the circles of human power. So some pack, you can see how the aircraft was constructed. Aluminium frame, spruce bars, ni uh, nylon covered and fabric covered wings. It really was a marvel of engineering. It was about 25 feet long, a wingspan about 80 feet, and it weighed in in those days at 128 pounds, about 60 kilos. Realistically, the size of the aircraft hasn't changed. What's changed now is it got a little bit lighter. The next big thing for me in my interest in this was the 70s. I wasn't around when Sunpak flew, but I was around in the 70s when Gossamer Albatross flew. Uh, this this plane featured in all of the news reports, the interesting reports of the day in the 70s, the sort of thing that a, a kid who was in, into engineering really was interested in. This is the first and the only plane ever to fly from England to France on purely human power. It, it was one of a number of the Gossamer planes. This was flown with an upright cyclist inside it, whereas even back in some pack days, they recognised the benefits of recumbent for creating a smaller pod. Um, this was one of a number of Gossamer aircraft, but I've got to say, as a, as a child of the 70s, this stuff absolutely amazed me. This plane, similar to some pack, was around a wingspan of 97 feet, yet it only weighed 70 pounds, so it lost about 60%, 40% of the weight. So really impressive, um, but it flew in very close proximity to the water. And I think the next slide probably shows that. You know, this is this is how close you get. Once you're off the ground, let's not waste any effort getting any higher. Let's keep going and 
he was quite close to the water all the way across the channel. Interesting, and you know, it looked very much like cling film, kitchen film, stretched over some very thin and spindly ribs. For me, this is probably a seminal moment in being interested in aircraft. There's been a load of other stuff happen, but the next thing that really sparked my interest was Steamboat Willie. And Steamboat Willie is a human-powered hovercraft that was built in, in University College London. And I don't know what a, a, a hovercraft is. Is it an aircraft? It gets off the ground, it suffers from gravity, and it floats on a cushion of air. This was at the World Championships in 2008. I'd only just got into recumbents, and suddenly you're meeting people who are building and developing things like that. And it, it was truly inspirational to meet the sort of people who do this stuff. And the guys who were involved in Steamboat Willie were also involved in other aeronautical courses and aeronautical feats, and some of them were involved in setting up Icarus Cup. The Icarus Cup was an idea to get human-powered flying together on a, a, a basis across the UK. And a number of academics, a number of successful flyers got together and they started a competition in 2011. And they invited anybody who could build an aircraft and fly it to come to that meeting. I, I've had the, the luxury and the pleasure to be a day visitor at those events a couple of times. And this year, I really invested the effort and I went down for the best part of a week. See the guys, not take part, but be a part of it, up close and personal with these planes. And it really was a wonderful opportunity and it was great to meet these people who do this as their primary hobby, the way that we have as a primary hobby, recumbent racing. So the champion, it is a championship, it's a racing event. People are challenged to fly a kilometre or a triangle or a slalom or a figure of eight. And they're, they're challenged in accuracy, taking off from the ground and landing within a certain distance of a spot. And what's different here is all the planes have to be human powered in their takeoff. You know, you could call a hang glider a human powered aircraft. A man carries it, runs down a hill and leaps into the air. But he's using gravity and the wind. These planes, literally, the guy winds it up on the ground, on the taxiway, and it's the force of the man pedalling it. And once it's away, it's up to him to keep it there in the air. This is one of the most successful sorts of planes that are flying in the UK. This is designed by a professional aeronautical engineer, John Edgley, and he, he's designed a number of these planes. And this is Aerocycle Mark III flying. And it's very similar in its anatomy to the other aircraft that you've seen. They're around about 80 foot wingspan. They're around about 30, 40 feet long. And these things are weighing in at 100 pounds, a little bit less. Um, rules of the competition, these planes need to be human powered entirely. They need to be capable of safely being controlled and they need to be able to be safely landed. And for the purposes of flying these machines, which are made of polystyrene and very thin films and Dacron and Mylar, they need to limit their flight height to 50 feet or 15 meters. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot. Most of us have been in aeroplanes that flown a lot higher than that. But I tell you, if you come from the air down to the ground, 50 feet is quite a long way to fall. So for safety purposes, it does seem like quite a good idea. Uh, basic anatomy as you see it, very, very, very long wing, fabulously lightweight, leads to its flexibility. On the ground, that wing's horizontal. In flight, it, it creates a U-shape and it bends. Just behind the wing, there's a propeller rotating around the main boom. And then at the rear, you have a very simple rudder and a very simple elevator. Uh, and the pilot flies it by pedaling and having a very, very small joystick. It's just this, it's even smaller than a games controller. And that's how the pilot alters those controls. His primary input is absolutely giving it his all on the pedals. So at the championships this year, we had two aerocycles and a third machine, which was Lazarus, uh, a Southampton University. This is, this is an aerocycle. 
in flight at Lasham Airfield where the championships were held. In the background, that's, that is a commercial airliner, but it's one that's been retired. It's on the ground at the end of the runway being recycled. And it, it does create an interesting backdrop for photographs at times. Lazarus is the next iteration, if you like, of Southampton University's flying programme. It's not a university-sponsored event. This is a student union sporting club. And it's students who've picked up a project that was used with Guy Martin in 2012-2013. Now, Guy is a, a very interesting uh, character. He's worked with the BHPC as well. And he did a Channel 4 documentary series called Speed, during which he, he covered a number of items. He did the world's fastest tandem. I did the world's fastest sledge on snow. And he attempted to fly human-powered. So the aircraft was used for that. After the TV program, it was abandoned. And a number of years later, a dedicated group of Southampton University Aeronautical Engineers picked up the project, took it on, and said, let's have a go, hence the name Lazarus. Um, it's entirely down to the enthusiasm of those young people that this plane even exists, never mind that it actually flies. Um, they are very limited in their resources, but this plane, while we were at the Icarus Cup, it got a number of flights. And this one here is pre-Icarus, where they managed to get sort of two or three seconds off the air. At Icarus, they were aiming for, and they achieved a five-second flight. That actually gives the team a thousand pounds prize from the Royal Air Aeronautical Society. That's more than three times what the Southampton University Students' Union pay them as a sponsorship grant towards operating the club. So it really does give them, one, some real financial incentive to do it, and two, some finance to, to support what they do as well as reward. This is Lazarus as it stands on land. You know, it's a, a wonderful craft. It's similar, as we've said to the others. 80 foot is sort of wingspan on it. It weighs in, I think, at 40 kilos, about 90 pounds. It's easily carried by three men when it's moved on the ground, but it's an absolute beast of a thing to operate and move around. One of the interesting things is that the, the outer wing tips, must be the best part of 10 foot of the wing tip of each end, can be popped off, and it just makes it a little narrower to transport when walking it around an airfield. When you talk about the limits of engineering, those wing tips, when I was asked to remove one, I said, well, where's the pin? How do I unlock it? They said, you just slide it out. I said, but you fly with that wing tip in. Yeah, we just rely on the friction of the tubes as they bend against each other to hold the wing tips on. So not only flying in something made of polystyrene, balsa wood and cling film, it's actually held together with nothing more scientific than friction of tube on tube. These guys understand the engineering and the forces and things involved, but due to the limits I was explaining about the club and its finances and where it's come from, they've had to use what they inherited from the previous iteration of this aircraft. And that meant that there's a, a sponsored bicycle hanging in it that was the sponsored bicycle from the TV show. Uh, for them, they'd like to rebuild. And for me, I'd like to be involved with these guys. They were incredibly welcoming to a strange bloke who walked into the bar on the Wednesday night. And I got on well with these guys. So I'm hoping to help them out in future years and see some successes for them. Back to the competition in Icarus. There was a formal competition and two, two pilots competed over a number of events during the week. The slalom, the, the timed one kilometre trial, etc. And a chap called Kip Buchanan, fabulous pilot, wonderful skills, demonstrated the fastest time and the most accurate flying and took the championship away from a chap called Lewis Rowlandson. For me, it was great to see that, to see some human-powered flying. However, the greatest thing for me was seeing what's going on on this slide here. And this is Lewis riding an upright bike alongside David, who's a new pilot. There's the best part of a dozen new pilots learned to fly human-powered aircraft during Icarus this year. And that, the spirit of it, 
Lewis, whilst he could be competing in an event, was actually putting the effort in, riding alongside these. Kit was doing similar, helping people out, putting them on simulators. And the, the joy of seeing a new pilot get out of that plane, having flown it under their own power, was incredible. Something I don't know if I'll ever achieve, but I got the buzz when I had a go on Steamboat Willie, the hovercraft, so I know the buzz that these guys were getting, and I could see just how impressed they were at having the opportunity to do this. This is, for me, the spirit of Icarus, and it was wonderful to see. Now, one of the great things about AeroCycle is that it was designed by a professional engineer who is based in, in flying. Now, this is better fly. This is a plane that, at the minute, isn't flying in the UK, but it's there. People are working on this. This was designed and built in 2015 by an engineer from a, a, a background elsewhere, motorsports, called David Barford. And he built this so that he could fly. And it demonstrates what can still be done with that spirit of innovation and engineering, um, very much a British sort of thing. But this is an opportunity. It demonstrates that a man in a shed can still do this. What's coming next? What, what else is there in the UK? Well, the hope is that we'll have an Icarus Cup in 2022. The hope is that we'll have a, a cross-channel race and people are organising a new attempt to take on the Gossamer Albatross record. And I think that would be incredible to see. So whilst we're struggling in the UK to, to raise more than three planes at the championship and we go back to things that we're doing in 2015, we have Japan. In Japan, there's a fabulous circuit here. And I think it's because the universities, unlike Southampton that leave it to the students to do for themselves, these students in Japan, it's a big part of the, the university scene. A large number of universities take part in this. And they, they create these planes and they have wonderful championships. And I know that Gary's attempting to get some of the, the Japanese guys to, to talk, but they fly tens of kilometres. And I think Gary's might be able to put up a link, or if not, there's a link on YouTube to a guy flying 60 kilometers in a Japanese plane. They'll often fly over water because they, they see that as a safer method. If they crash, it, it's not quite as harsh as crashing on tarmac. They tend to be in recumbent positions, this chap is. And you know, where they vary from the current UK market is they tend to have a propeller out front of the wing rather than behind it. Um, but very much they believe in a recumbent, giving them a much smaller pod. The interesting thing was we, we went out to the pub one night after Southampton managed a three-second flight, and it was three seconds. doesn't sound like a lot, but if you're on the ground with a GoPro chasing that plane while it's airborne for three seconds, it seems like quite a long time. That guy is in there. He's powering that plane, no doubt. We went out, we celebrated. Three seconds sounds nothing, but it led to a celebration. And after that, we sat and had a chat and we had a sketch and what what can we do? And remarkably, we sketched roughly what a Japanese aircraft is. So, you know, amateur engineers, amateur cyclists, that looks very much like an optimum solution. Wow. So, one of these days... I hope that the money is there for those British universities to have a go at it, to, to put put a bit of effort in and build a Japanese plane. Let's see 50 kilometers in Britain. A great effort on the individuals, but there are small numbers of people around the world actually working on this, it would seem, and it would be great to see a, a larger effort going. It, it would be wonderful to see a larger effort, Gary, but money, it, it does require a bit of carbon fiber. It does require the best quality Dacron, it does require some lightweight films. You also need to have a trailer. You need to have that ability to move this thing around. If you're going to work on it, you, you can't do it in an average garage. Universities have these facilities. It would be fabulous to see. The way that the Australians have embraced the Pedal Power Grand Prix for tricycles, the Japanese have embraced pedal-powered aircraft for their universities. The Royal Aeronautical Society, to give them their due, they put a thousand pounds up every year for formula flight, they put three thousand pounds up for those who could do 15 seconds. 
there is some incentive there. And to see the guys get the five seconds at dawn on the Friday morning was wonderful. They felt like they'd won the World Cup. For those guys, it was truly successful. You see the spirit of Battle Mountain? You you know, Gary, I'm involved in Battle Mountain teams and physically working on that as we speak. Um, hoping to be there myself. You know, that is the holy grail for me would be to get to Battle Mountain. I, I think I'd rather be in Battle Mountain than to fly a human-powered aircraft. All right. Well, we'll just leave that whole subject <laughs> up in the air, if you will. And I think we're going to uh, close this interview out for now. But uh, Barney, thank you so much for uh, making the effort to uh, bring this very interesting uh, subject uh, to our viewers. And uh, we hope you'll continue to be our correspondent in these and other interesting building matters in the UK. So Barney Harl, thank you so much. Of course. Thank you, Gary. And I look forward one of these days we'll see each other again in person somewhere. That would be great. Thanks, Barney. Thank you. Well, at least virtually we're seeing each other again. Barney, hi. How are you? Good evening, Gary. It is great to have you. What a great segment. Very interesting stuff. Uh, a few things uh, I want to chat with you about. Uh, I want to invite, again, our audience, if you have questions or comments on what you just saw about uh, human-powered flight, please put them in the chat right now. And that includes uh, my panelists. If you guys are interested in talking uh, or have any questions or comments about it, it looks like Nina says it was a great presentation. Put it in the private chat, guys. We'll pop you up there. So, uh, Barney, first of all, uh, our uh, good friend, uh, Alan Goodman, has commented here. Uh, <laughs> we, we talked about the Japanese team. And, folks, I will, uh, I will post that link. Uh, they are making remarkable progress and have video of a guy that went like 60 kilometers uh, it's all there. It's not the most interesting video except the beginning and near the end, I guess. But it is an amazing achievement. And I think they are interested in competing with uh, you guys here in the future. Um, you want to pop that banner off for me, please, uh, Trey? And I'm going to then put Alan uh comment up can we please have the Japanese guys? Because their accents will certainly be easier to cope with than Barney's. Yeah. Al Al Alan's wife pointed out last weekend that we do a good double act. <laughs> you do. You guys are quite a team. So <laughs> thank you, Alan. I'm glad you're watching. And uh, I will not uh, comment on that comment. So um, let's uh, go back up a little bit. I had a couple of questions. First of all, uh, Annie, I, I think a comment answer as well uh, about ground effect. Uh, Barney, do you feel capable of talking about uh, ground effect? So let uh people know what that is and such, or if not, I'll. I understand ground effect um, to, to some extent. I'm not an aeronautical engineer, but as the plane comes lower to, the, to a surface, a cushion of air is formed, um, and the Russians used it for flying things called ekranoplans, where they flew very low to the ground and you get a, an effect. Um, and Spitfire pilots in World War II apparently used it to their benefit to, to literally get machines home in pieces. Um, Yes, although rumor has it that when Gossamer Albatross tried, they did find it easier to get slightly higher off the sea, that there was less interference in the wind at that level. So my understanding, just very basically, we, I don't know the details, but I, it is an added amount of lift to the plane as it nears the actual ground. Is that it, fair? It creates creates a cushion of air yeah. that makes it slightly easier to fly, yes. Right. And may have something to do with the uh, the velocity of the plane, though, too. And these, this is pretty slow, so we don't really know, but it's a, that's a good point. Um, here we go. How about rule cycle? Is flying an E-assisted trike quad or maybe Velmobile with a light aircraft wing possible? Of course, you know we're going to get this question. So what do you think, Barney? Uh, I'm not at all certain. It, apps, one of the most critical features is getting it light lightweight it, so once you start putting electric motors once you start putting velomobile type technology in you know some of these planes weigh less than some of the commercial velomobiles that are available these days yeah yeah all right uh, one of the, one of one of the questioners i think it's room 360 asked about the the flying license yes situation. i was going there next go ahead yeah so the, these 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 planes are flown as what they call experimental wings. 
there are certain rules in the UK, and I, I, I guess there will be in all parts of the world, where you can launch an experimental plane, and it's only being launched for test purposes. And the British Hang Gliding and Paragliding Club offer a, a training license that gives third party insurance. So our pilots fly under that designation, if you like. You don't need to be a qualified flyer. Do you know anything about anyone who crossed the Mediterranean Sea with human power? <laughs> I, I do. Good question. Okay. Um, and I noticed one or two guys mentioning the original Icarus, the, the Greek mythology. But yes, there, there have been a number of flights elsewhere in the world. It's not my primary hobby, so I, I, I don't pretend to be the, the font of all knowledge on this one. Dave Holliday. Daft lateral thinking. Could a roll-up wing with tension stiffening like an old magician's collapsing wands work to deal with the storing and transport and transporting high uh, aspect ratio wings? There's all sorts of ideas being used. Um, so some of the pioneers even tried inflatable wings. Right, so, right. Th th there's many, many ways to, to come up with a solution. Lars, you want to bring Trey up? I think Trey has a question here for Barney as well. Trey, you uh, yourself. Yeah, go ahead. Curious, you had a question. Do y'all track how many watts the rider is generating to sustain level flight? Sorry, Trey, didn't get the full question. So how many watts is the rider generating to sustain level flight? I, I believe it's around the 300 watt mark. Um, they were struggling to get airborne. They're producing peaks well in excess of 700 for the first few seconds to get them off the ground. Um, and according to what we were trying on the simulator, it looked like 250, 300, 350 watts mm -hmm. being yeah. sustainable. And people were flying while we were there. Uh, there's Lewis's comment at five watts per kilogram. Lu is, Lewis, is Lewis a member of the club? He's made some good comments here and <laughs> answered some <laughs> questions. Lewis is on a number of those photos. That that okay, Lewis right. is Lewis who was on the upright bike following David. Thank you slide. for joining us, Lewis. Excellent. We appreciate Thanks, Lewis. It. All right. Yes, there's another historical uh, <laughs> uh, response. So very good. All right. I think that's probably where we're going to leave it. Uh, Barney, any final thoughts uh, as you go? No. If anybody wants to sponsor a human-powered plane in Britain. You know where the money would go. They would all enjoy it fabulously. All right. Well, Barney Harl, thank you. I understood you perfectly, so I don't know what Alan's talking about. Uh, so please, you're welcome to come back anytime. We look forward to the next subject you're going to cover for us. Uh, we hope to see you soon. I hope to be stateside next year. Sounds good. Thanks, Barney. All right, folks, let's move along uh, again. This next segment is going to be Steve Nurse, the author of Cycle Zoo. We've had quite a few entries already, but if you're joining us a little late, if you type in, as you see there, hashtag Z-O-O, -O, all in lowercase, you will be entered into the drawing. We've only got 14 entries so far, so your chances are pretty good. We're going to give away three books. So uh, please uh, type in hashtag Zoo. Uh, in the chat, either on Facebook or YouTube, and you will be entered, and we will make that drawing after uh, we end up talking to Steve at the end of his video here. So we hope you'll take advantage of that. So let's uh, go ahead and get started and see what Steve had to say about uh, his thoughts about the book and recumbent cycling in general. Lars? I am here with Steve Nurse. He is engineer, author, and Bent Rider, and we are down in Melbourne, Australia to visit Steve. Steve, how are you today? Ah, uh, very well. I don't think you could quite visit us today because of coronavirus, but you know we're we're communicating virtually, and that um that's what counts. Virtual visits is what we do on the Late Back Bike Report. So welcome to yep. the show, Steve. And uh, let's start out if we could with uh, an introduction. Could you tell the audience a little bit uh, about yourself, your background, and uh, the intersection of your life and recumbent bikes? Um, I've, I've been an engineer for all, uh, for all my life. That's, that's been my profession, and um, I'm nearing retirement age and um, really only working intermittently now. 
Um, uh, but I still do a lot of work on recumbent bikes. I, I started building recumbents in about um, 1987 and I was in Germany at the time and it took me a long time to get anything useful but after about 10 years I had something that I could ride about 200 kilometres and I've kept on with my own home builds and just um, developed them since then. And, and, and I've had a, a proper engineering career uh, mainly in electric motors but also pumps, um, printing machines, uh, roto moulding, all all sorts of things. More recently it's been my career. I've had jobs in uh, um, researching recumbent bikes. So, yeah, it's been good. All right, Steve, great. And as I mentioned earlier, you are also an author, and I think we're going to focus your presentation around your book, but uh, you have a number of things to talk about here. You mentioned uh, motors, something that you worked on earlier, and I think that's uh, where we're going to kick it off. Uh, yeah, so this is one of the motors I was in involved with. Um, this motor is about the size of a loaf of bread, but um, I've... I worked on a lot of aspects on the, on this particular motor. I designed the uh, plastic box on the top and the rubber resilient mount, and then the the base of it is um, laser cut. So I did a two D drawing for that. Um, so generally, I know my way around these um, things reasonably well. I, I mentioned being involved with bikes, so this this is my um, sort of bike engineering background that um, these books were around at the time when I was starting to build bikes more seriously. From about 1994 to 2003, all these were out. And the next slide shows just one particular bike, um, which is a Bevo bike. And you, I, I would see these books so often that they would sort of get stuck in my imagination. And um, this, this bike's front wheel drive, but it's also direct drive. Um, there's no pulley on the drive side between the um, the crank and the and the wheel. Um, and qu quite a bit later. On, um, if we go to the next slide, I sort of, I, I sort of worked out for a lot of bikes um, what the stresses in the frame might be because of the chain, and um, I've I've done this sort of diagram for quite a few bikes. This is one of the bikes that I built, um, sort of probably about ten years ago. You know, one I would have done two hundred k rides on. And, um, yeah, I'm just sort of starting to establish a sort of a template for things that I've built. It's, it's front-wheel drive, and you'll see that my knees are up in between uh, the part, parts of the steering, and, and so you can't turn a lot when you're pedalling, and if you did turn a lot, the chain would come off. So a lot of my building's been complemented by doing racing with recumbents, and then just social riding. Um, so this is on, on the trikes, on the rec, on the recumbents, are um, Alan Ball and Robert Werizak, my friend, and, and, like, this is just interesting. It's it's at a tweed ride and, and there's, um, you know, sort of ancient history of, of, of trikes and bikes and modern history, and it's all there in the one photo. So the Bevo bike was one of my uh, influences of um, of recumbents and um, Vai Vuong, who's who's from the US, from California, um, he's another one of my influences. And he um, made a, a lot of these sort of Python trikes, but he's not really interested in refinement and so he makes things that he just drives around and he films them, and he gets. I think some of his videos gets hits in the millions, or you know, very, very many. So he's got he's got very interesting ideas, um, but he never takes them terribly 
terribly far. And and this video sort of got under my skin um, as well, and I wanted to build something like what he does. These are the first set of wheels that I made that would um, suit suit a a, um, tri a leaning trike that works on the principle of one of Vi Vi Vuong's trikes. I'm an engineer, and this was put it together in a very random way. And you you can get pedal shafts. The wheels aren't the same as each other, and it's sort of just a bit of an engineering mess. Um, and you couldn't do it in production because it's yeah. But I've I've got with me here um, my so my design solution for that. And I got about um, 30 or 40 of these made. Um, once you set up to make something like this with an NC, uh, you you can just go for it. And the, you know, the last ones cost very little more than the the first one. So I'm, I'm still using these. I'm almost running out, but I've I use these with um, through axle 16 and 20 inch wheels, which you can get. So my very first experiment making of a long trike was um, like this, and you can see what the frame of the trike is. It's it's sort of just a plank of wood, and there's not that much more sophisticated about it. You you drill a few holes in it, and then you also need um, steel or other reinforcements where the bearings are so the, um, yeah, things don't rip apart. The box is a combined seat and tail box and it's aerodynamic and it carries luggage and I, I still use virtually exactly the same thing today, slightly more refined. This is my shop where I'm doing some of the building. So I've got a shed where I keep all my parts but it's can't take things like this in it. So all my buildings outside, I've got a few verandas and stuff I can put things under so that when it rains, things don't get wet. That's actually riding the first trike, th that trike, which was all in process. Um, and it was quite surprising that it worked as well as it did. <laughs> it worked, worked almost straight away. This trike's got long... Uh, axles holding up the back wheels and I've made them a lot shorter on trikes that I use these days but you can just buy unicycle cranks off the shelf and you just use it. Over several years I've refined things and so I actually got a chance to study and do work on this sort of trike as an industrial design master's degree so that was sort of almost full-time designing trikes and so this is sort of like the end the end product yeah so I didn't stop with that trike it wasn't enough that I just got it working I had to sort of had an itch to scratch and I wanted to make that um, make that better and so about maybe five or six years later this is a, a, a more refined product um, it's it's made out of timber again and the whole thing is this whole thing is made from nc routed four mil plywood um and and you can see there's a white core flute panel there but but you can swap that out and um you can have a cloth material so you can make it sort of look whatever you like or you can have timber so it's all timber when i got it sort of refined to this level i put it up on the um, Thingiverse website, so there are plans for that and for free, and you can just you can build it if you're motivated and you have um, enough equipment, or if your friends have got enough equipment. And then alongside the the development of this timber version, I also did a aluminium frame version, um, which honestly I've written the aluminium one quite a bit more. You can tell from the you know just just the sort of sample that I've shown, maybe three or four different um, machines, but I've built I've built a lot more. And look, I accumulated a lot of knowledge, and I just thought, I just thought, look, there's so many people who don't see recumbents very 
often and they would have no idea. I've got my head in it all the time and I've sort of got something, you know, some knowledge and I've read all the old books and stuff. And and so I decided to put a book out and um, I self-published um, the one with the white cover that's in that's in the slide. Um, that was about 10 years ago. And then just kept on accumulating more knowledge and I th- thought that there was a time, another time, you know, about two years ago, oh, I can do it again. I can update the book and I can uh, make it a bit better than the first one. Maybe I could distribute it a bit better. And um, so I, I put out another version and that's only been out about um, two months. Well, that's just great, uh, Steve. How interesting. I've read the book. It's uh, <clears throat> it's quite a tome. It's it, it's very comprehensive. Uh, lots of practical information. Good stories. Uh, I, I think uh, anyone who has any inclination towards bicycles and especially recumbents uh, will get a lot out of uh, out of Cycle Zoo. What is your advice to the new tinkerer, the guy who sees uh, you uh, uh, today and says, you know, I'd like to try something like that. Uh, how do you get started? 3D printing is sort of really very accessible, and I use 3D printing to make little models and also to make act- make actual bike parts. The printer I've got is about $400 or something like that, and it can really you, – you really don't – you just need a room in your house. You have a section yeah, you, in your book – Steve, about your shop, like and how it, yeah, yeah. And, and the equipment and such. Did you, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, like, I've I've built my shed up over over a while, over a fair while. You want to buy the best the best set of tools you can afford, um, but also just work on normal bikes too, because. Um, I, you know, I see a few students at uni who are, um, who have started on bike projects or recumbent bike projects, and they don't know what their way around a normal bike. So, if you've fixed about a hundred normal bikes for charity or for yourself, then you're that's a good start to going on the way of the recumbent because then. If you then want to go off on a tangent somewhere and go, oh, I don't want to do this. That's the way it is on a bike. But no, uh-uh. I'm going to do something special here. Then at least you've got that experience the way it it normally works, and you might have an idea how to um, take it to the next take it to the next step. Why do you consider recumbent uh, bikes and trikes to be such uh, a good platform? for experimentation and development uh, in, in the bike world? The main thing is that it hasn't been done before and that they're not so they're not so accessible. So, um, you know, secondhand bikes, uh, at least in Melbourne, that they can be very cheap if they're if they haven't been fixed up. Um, and there's really no challenge in building one um, because you I mean, there's there's a challenge. You can build one, but it's just a purely technical challenge. Um, when you get to the end and you've built you've built your standard bicycle, you've got something that you could have gone down to Kmart and bought for two hundred dollars, and yours is probably worse than that, and the one you've built. And so that you know, oh, you sort of go, well, what's the point? But then you go through the process with a, a recumbent bike, and you there's still some space there um, to do something different and to um, you know to to evolve things and to and to move things on. And so it it you know there are rewards, and I'm still finding things that I can do that's that are different, and I enjoy doing them. My next question has to do with a more specific. uh, development that you talked about in in the book that I was intrigued by. Maybe you can expand on this a bit. You mentioned something about uh, in in creative ways of of designing and building uh, of using a Velomobile shell as a battery. 
Now, uh, you, you, you talk about <laughs> using motors and such. I was just kind of intrigued by that, uh, that concept. Can you talk a little bit more about that? What they want to do with electric aeroplanes is to um, have the shell of the aeroplane, which is already composite materials in some, but they want to have that as a, as a battery storage as well. And so they want to save some of the dead weight of the battery and have it doing um, an extra job. And so I just talk about some of these technologies like like that and like big 3D printers and say, look, we've got to, you've got to put these into velomobiles, make them exciting, you know, for researchers. And the other thing is that they're really simple applications and velomobiles aren't going to fall out of the sky. Is it the sun trip, the mm -hmm. solar rally? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, there's a big rally just finished in Europe. Europe and, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and they combine um, different vehicles um, with with solar and with ele electric and, you know, have interesting outcomes. There's a wide variety of vehicles in in that space already. And um, so, yeah, it would be good if, you know, things got shooken up a bit and some of the most advanced um, materials and technologies got got put into the Velomobiles. All right, well, let's finish up uh, with uh, what is next for Steve Nurse. I'm building an interesting rear suspension at the moment, and the, the rear fork slides into the um, tube of the uh, bike. Um, the frame is... The frame is just one aluminium beam. Um, yeah, so the rear fork slides into that and it's got a couple of uh, suspension elastomers. So I'm I'm working on that. And um, if you click on the links on the YouTube video, um, you should be able to see some of that development. That's great. And we're going to have all those links in the description below here for uh, Steve and his book and uh, some of the things that he's talked about. But, well, Steve, thank you so much for taking time out uh, to share your thoughts uh, and your publications and your ideas uh, with the Laid Back Black Report. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Yep. Here it is. And there he is. Hello, Steve. Hi. Steve. Hi, how are you? Good, good, Steve. Uh, folks, you you will know uh, if you know anything about the time zones uh, that Steve is up in the middle of the night practically uh, to join us live today, which we really appreciate. Steve, I'm just going to uh, have, we, we pretty well covered everything in the video, but uh, Alex, I think, has a question. He a fellow builder, and he has a quick question. Lars, can you pop Alex up for us and let... Uh, and in the meantime, folks, while Alex is asking his questions, your last chance, hashtag lowercase Z-O-O, -O, right there. Do it, and you will be entered in a couple minutes. We're going to do our drawing. So, Alex, go ahead and ask uh, Steve a question. Uh, hi, Steve. Yeah, I, I just hi. was interested that a lot of your bikes seem to be wooden construction, and I wondered if that was from an engineering perspective or a sort of environmental perspective. Um why do you use wood? It, it, it's it's a bit more of an engineering challenge. Um, I guess, I'm, you know, I'm just sort of like flexing a few muscles to, you know, design muscles to try the uh, whole frame out of wood. But what I've been making mm. – yeah, you can um, NC route it and sort of put it together like a three D jigsaw puzzle. Um, so that's that's quite a quite a bit of fun. Um, so yeah, you can go too far with wood, like some people try to make like wooden ball bearings and careful like there now, Steve. We we <laughs> haven't seen Alex's segment yet. So be careful what you say. Anyway, yeah, no, it's it's. It's, it's an interesting challenge. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I'd want to ride one, you know, like make one and ride one on the road all the time, particularly when it's wet, but it's, um, yeah, it's a good thing to do. 
<laughs> well, hopefully you're like my uh, my bike. You might see in a minute. You will be seeing that, man. Thanks for the question, Alex. We'll see you in, in a couple of minutes here. All right. So I think at this time, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, and do the giveaway. So uh, just to uh, let my panelists know, if you're a part of the laid back bike report, no, I don't care if we draw your name. You're not getting the book. So, um, other than that, uh, if you're in the uh, if you're in North America, we should be able to uh, mail you this. If you're uh, elsewhere and you win, we'll uh, Steve and I have talked. We'll do our best to see. Maybe we can get to the ebook or something. We'll do what we can for you. So, in any case, uh, yeah, I like that shot, Lars. Let's go. no, go ahead. I, I think it's okay to have a. But yeah, that's great. Um, then you can uh, get our reactions. Steve, I'm sure we'll have a very animated reaction for five o'clock in the morning. Uh, we're going to go ahead and draw for our first winner for the Cycle Zoo book. Here we go. There we're, are, we're pushing the edges of technology here. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so Stefan Hogberg. Okay, Stefan, congratulations. He is our first winner. Uh, Stefan, if you will uh, contact us at uh, laidbackbikereport at gmail.com uh, and give us your particulars, uh, I, will, I will get back to you and we'll see if we can work out something about getting you uh, that first book. And so uh, all right, congratulations. And let's go ahead and draw for book number two. Here we go. Um, so the book costs about um, $40, but there's an ebook which is much closer to $10. And there's technology in the ebook which makes it um, a good and accessible. Good. So if you aren't a winner today, like Ed Retzler is, then uh, you can go ahead. Of course, we encourage you to purchase or uh, either e, e or the or the physical book. Congratulations, Ed. And thank you for... Uh, we're trying the contest up here. And uh, again, Ed, laidbackbikereport at gmail.com. And uh, we will be in touch and see if we can send you a book. And here we go. This will be our last winner today for the Cycle Zoo book from Steve Nurse. Look at all those people rolling through. Chris Tarugo. Okay, Chris, congratulations to you. And uh, one more time, laidbackbikereport at gmail.com. So send me an email uh, if you are one of our three winners, and uh, we will see about getting you uh, Steve Nurse's book. So, all right, if you'll just two shot us then again, uh, Lars, as we say goodbye. Steve, any final words? Uh, no, just um, have, have fun building recumbent bikes and i'm always um writing a, i'm a prolific blogger and i'm always writing about different things um fixing old bikes and making my new designs and making designs that aren't recumbent bikes at all so yeah we will keep um, watching and keep uh yeah keep keep up with the books we we look forward to maybe your next project there uh, you just got done with this one so uh, but Steve, it's been a pleasure getting a chance to, to know you a little bit. And uh, I know we'll be back in touch soon. Okay. Thanks very much, Gary. All right. Bye-bye, okay. Steve. All right. So let me get back to my script here. We will be now moving along uh, to our third guest, uh, which uh, you briefly uh, you briefly saw Alex a minute ago. He's got a build of his own to talk about. And so I think uh, uh, we'll just go ahead and, and see that right now, Lars. We are here with Alex Baines Buffery from the UK. How are you today, Alex? Hi, Gary. I'm very well, thank you. We are so glad to have you with us now. Alex is a uh, recumbent builder enthusiast, and he has put together a really an interesting bike that I think you guys are going to like. Um, if we could, before we take a look at the bike, Alex, tell us a little bit about uh, how you came upon recumbents and how they fit into your life so far. Uh, so I think um, when I was at university, I found a video about the um, human powered airplanes. 
and just ended up going down the rabbit hole, realizing there was this whole world of human powered vehicles and was just totally fascinated by the idea that you could get up to so much speed under just muscle power alone. And then I realized that you could actually buy um, recumbents, recumbent bikes and I've desperately wanted one for a long time but unfortunately just other things like buying a house and having children um, got in the way and um, one day I I had I, I built furniture I built an e-bike and retrofitted a motor to it and I just decided that I could slam those two skill sets together and build my own wooden recumbent um, and so, yeah, it was for me, it was a very um, a cheap way of getting into the sport, basically. Very good. Well, I think what we need to do next is actually take a look at what you built. You've done a nice description on this little video here. Let's have a look at what you described. So this is the overall bike. Um, as you can see, it's quite compact. Uh, it was designed so that I could throw it in the back of a car. This, um, it's constructed as a wooden box. I've kept the top open because I like having a glove box where I can leave tools to fix it when we're going around. Um, a few weird things I did. At the back, you can see there's just a block of wood where the brakes are hanging off. Um, I've got this really cool uh, 3x7 satch hub and I read online that you can make them asymmetrical and it will stiffen the bike up so I decided to do that just to see if it would work and it did um, but obviously means that the front and rear wheels are not in line they're actually slightly offline but I've never found it a problem um, I decided to run the cables into the frame to make it a bit more aerodynamic and uh, it's worked really well um, I bought some cheap Chinese carbon fiber forks off the inset and they're also working well, although I did find it was best to mount them backwards. I got a nice uh, quality front wheel off um, uh, from Germany and the back wheel is one that I stole from my original recumbent bike that I broke. Um, you can see that it's basically a sandwich construction. It's just lots of bits of plywood stuck together, um, which I think means it would make an excellent thing to be CNC routed. And then the boom is a box. And because of the width of the box, it's very stiff. Um, the whole bike is actually a slightly banana shaped. Um, that's something that I wasn't able to control for when I was building, but it actually works quite well because the banana you're pushing against the banana shape. So it seems to have increased stiffness, although I'm not sure. You can see how I just quickly used a front chain thing to manage the chain onto the chain ring because it was falling off initially. That has worked quite well, though. It makes quite a lot of noise. Um, down here, I, use, I bought this, this from Holland. It's a proper thing, although I gather you can get them off weights machinery. And then I was still losing the chain occasionally, but I've managed to sort that out by just putting a jockey wheel here. Um, and then that's it. This is the uh, chain ring set that I stole from my original road bike. And uh, that's it. It's got good front brakes, terrible back brakes. And uh, there's a whole steering system over there that you can see I've cobbled together from other parts and put on some nice curly handlebars. So that's about it. Thank you. Very good. Very good, Alex. So <laughs> let's, uh, if we could at this point, take a step back and let's see how you put this all together. So basically, uh, my background is I'm a, a TV researcher in factual TV. So I'm, I'm quite good at trawling the internet and finding things. And I, I realized that, uh, well, I, I wondered if anybody had ever made a plywood recumbent before. And the, the reason why I wanted to make it out of plywood is A, I don't weld, uh, which is quite important. And B, uh, I didn't want to weld because I have a two-year-old and a six-year-old in my house. And I don't know how many of you guys have been to Britain, but we tend to live in quite tiny houses by American standards. So there would definitely be a child coming around the corner looking at the um, arc welder and blinding themselves. Um, so I found this guy um, and it's it's been made by a guy called David who's in Holland. And he actually constructed this thing when he was a teenager 
um, and rode it for years until he eventually broke it. Um, and I, I managed to find him. He's now, we're roughly the same age and he's a professional engineer. So he, based on that bike and some other bikes he's designed, because he, he does this properly, makes carbon fiber things, he threw together a design for a recumbent for me. This is it, it's a, a wonderful thing. I I gave him a few criteria or said what I needed. And um, one of the things we do is, uh, my family, we personally don't own a motor vehicle, but we use something called Enterprise Car Club, which means that quite often I will rent a small hatchback car by the hour or for a day. And I knew that if I was going to race this machine, it would have to go in a small car. Um, and ideally, I'd want to just throw it in. So what I, what I do now, the bike's built, is just move the passenger seat forward a bit, put the back seats down, and then throw the bike in, um, which is why it has two small wheels. Um, and we, I did want it to be fast, which is why it's got an extremely aggressive uh, sort of ride position. And then the other thing was we wanted it to be really simple to build. Um, and the idea is that we've created a Facebook group and anybody can use this design and construct, sort of follow along and construct their own bike. So, so this is our electric buggy bike. This is how my family typically get around. Um, and so I, I viewed the recumbent as something that I might be able to race, but also uh, something that would kind of stack on top of our cargo bike as a transport solution. So... This is pretty much our car, but it lives locally in our town. It very rarely goes beyond the next two towns from our house. And uh, what I wanted was when I didn't have the kids with me, something that would enable me to zip across to Leatherhead, my next town, very fast. Um, and so that was also part of the impetus for building the bike. So uh, this is a, just a picture to prove that the bike was made of wood. This is ultimately what it ended up looking like uh, just prior to painting just to establish that it, it was a, uh, a bike made of plywood. This is my old recumbent. Um, she has an amazing pedigree. It's actually won the uh, British Human Power Championships, I believe, in the 90s. Um, so before I uh, built my bike, my original cheapskate entrance into the world of recumbent cycling was to buy this. But unfortunately, I'm a much uh, fatter man than I think the guy who built that. So even after getting my brother-in-law, who's an excellent bike mechanic, to help me get that bike going, uh, I managed to ride it out to Leatherhead, the next town, and um, on the way to get the car, crack it in half because uh, the middle sort of pipe that held my weight wasn't quite strong enough. So sadly, I've got this fantastic machine in my garage, uh, not quite in two parts, but not really working. Um, but what I did manage to get from that bike was... Uh, the back wheel and some really good ideas about how to get a recumbent moving um, fast. And this is um, just to establish my uh, previous uh, construction skills. This is some garden furniture that I've made. And you might be able to tell when you see the, the finished product of the recumbent that it's exactly the same color because I use what the paint that was left from that job on the bike. Thanks. Uh, yeah, this is also just some other, I'm, I'm quite into, um, building eco projects. So I built like a solar powered heating, um, air heating system. And uh, these are some solar cookers that I've produced. So the, the bike is sort of very much in the mold of these things. Yeah, uh, this is a picture to show that the bike does actually fulfill one of its uh, design brief things. It goes into the, into a car. You can see the, uh, the boot on the higher car does in fact close, so job done. This uh, is just a, an image I put in to demonstrate that David, the proper engineer, did actually check. Um, there was some really good kind of design going in and he used software to make sure that it was actually strong enough to use. I thought I'd add this just in case anybody decides they want to follow in our footsteps. But the, the critical thing that makes this possible is that adhesives have just got incredibly good. So you now actually don't need an enormous area of wood to be stuck together for it to be able to hold the weight of a, a human. I'm, I don't know if you guys work in pounds, but I'm, I'm a hundred, over 100 kgs or um, 16 stone in British. And it just amazes me that wood glues have got good enough now that um, I can trust my life to it. This is uh, my old road bike that I've had for years and uh, adored. But I decided that um, I could build something faster. And part of the joy of this was wanting to spend about half as much money as I spent on that bike and get something that would go faster. 
And we were slightly limited. I think we're up to 13 bikes now in this household. So I knew that if I was going to have another bike, this one would probably have to go or find a new home anyway. And so this is one of at least two bikes that gave its life. Um, this is uh, to basically shows you how the bike is constructed. You can see a head tube um, glued into uh, two blocks of wood. And that is the basic shape of the bike, the, the, pro the side of the, the sort of body of it. And, and it's just, it was just literally cut on our kitchen table using a jigsaw and then glued up. And you can just about see the bottom bracket um, glued up in the bottom bracket block on the front of the boom. So here's another close up just to show the, uh, the bottom bracket glued in. And um, yeah, at various points, um, different parts of the bike were secreted in parts of our house, gluing in places where hopefully the children wouldn't find them. Uh, this is a thing to just show because of the way it was constructed. Um, a lot of the panels ended up having to be individually cut out and marked off. So you can just see where the head tube goes in and where the forks connect to the body. And then there's another block there that's sort of in the middle of the bike supporting my weight because of the way the sandwiches were all some, you know, sometimes I was gluing around a, a sort of a tube. And so uh, I had to sort of individually draw around these and I worked out the easiest way to do that was literally just to cut up cardboard and make a kind of template and then use that template to create the small panels that would infill the top and bottom of the box. I discovered that um, I hadn't quite followed David's design perfectly. So when I eventually came to add the, um, the legs at the back of the turkey, that... Um, my wheel couldn't go where he had suggested. So in the end, I got, I sort of channeled my A-level arts um, and just had to sort of lie it out on my lawn and work out where I wanted it. And this is um, me placing it. You can also see that I've acquired some chain stays and is the other bar called a seat stay? Um, and that's because I, another bike at this point had to give up its life. I decided I didn't want to fabricate the dropouts. So even though it added quite a lot of weight, um, cutting up an old steel mountain bike, I ended up using the forks and just trying to have a larger surface area to glue. But this was really me just losing my bottle, basically, and not trusting uh, David's design work, which I'm sure is excellent, but uh, it was a combination of also my handiwork not being fully trusted. Yeah, here's another photo just to show that it's literally just cheap hand clamps that you can buy in any DIY store, squeezing the glue together and making it all solid. Um, and then here's, so you can see, I'm going to cough <coughs> the um, head tube glued in place. And you can also see the, the squeeze out. Um, it was quite good to get a glue that does this foaming business, so it'll fill up any pockets. At the last moment, you, you might be able to remember the, the back legs of the, of the original design were quite thin and small. And uh, just in the end, I just couldn't trust that quite such a small contact area would hold my weight. And being a bit of a patty anyway, I decided I could probably carry the extra bike weight. So what I got was some corrugated plastic and stuck it to the side of the bike. And this actually helped me or allowed me to sort of affect the design of the bike a bit and style it. Like I, d I decided I quite like that blunt back end. So that and it's sitting in our homemade jig that I cobbled together. This is the the final bit It's the the back legs kind of getting stuck on the bike. Um, I ended up having to uh, put them in place, drill pilot holes, uh, take them out, glue it, go back in and then um, drill, um, sort of screw, screw them back on. But it's it's all worked fine. And a lot of people, or I think there's only four people who've made these spikes before me, but they've all chosen to expose the wood. Um, but in the end, I just didn't trust myself not to take it out in the rain. It was raining quite a lot by the time I'd got to the stage and I had some paint left over from when I built my garden furniture. So I just whacked a coat on knowing that um, I would invariably end up riding it in the rain. And um, somebody who made one before me found that when they, they rode it in the rain, it basically expanded and then they couldn't ride their bike anymore because they couldn't reach the pedals once the bike had expanded. And then um, this is obviously the finished product. No, it's done. Um, no, it's not. It's, uh, <laughs> it's somebody else who's made a uh, plywood bike that looks much nicer than mine. Um, but I just wanted to include it so that people realise that this is a really fast bike as well, um, that they can run really well and be made really beautifully, or they can be thrown together as quick as you can in your kitchen, your backyard, uh, like I did. And then um, finally, 
It's, it is an open source project and uh, we have put the designs out for anyone's copy and I've just submitted this because there is somebody else currently building one of these bikes. Uh, I think they've changed the design quite a lot. I think they're doing a, an inbuilt rear fairing, but it's great. Uh, they're following along. They're using a very similar construction method and I'm really excited to see what other bikes get built and I'm hoping that one day I can race somebody else who's using a very large clog like me. Oh, and uh, and that's a picture of the final article. Well, there we go. Uh, very nice, um, <laughs> Alex. That's great. Uh, I love I love the way that you just put stuff together. And this is not something you uh, that you've been doing for a ton of years, but you you have some really good insights, obviously, and you know how to make things work, which I think is is the key to this whole thing. Did you name this bike? yeah it's called frank because it's green and it has bolts sticking out of it so it's frankenstein um but it's also because it's made from the the dead body parts of other bicycles um but yeah i mean it's i i don't know enough yet about i i have ridden uh factory built recumbents and they're lovely um but i haven't ridden them enough to know how frank performs so i'm, I'm actually taking him to the human powered races this weekend to to sort of test his metal and see how fast he goes. Let's let's take a look at you riding, Frank, and uh, just give us your initial impressions, I guess. Sure. So that's me cheating, rolling off a neighbor's drive just to get going. I can do, um, you know, normal starts. Um, but yeah, it's good. It's obviously a very aggressive stance, and it, it took me a little while to work out the balance, but it's fine. Um, stiffening up the uh, the front block, uh, what's it called? The bottom bracket took a while. There's there's um, little metal plates just screwed in on the front to hold it in place. But now I've managed to get that strong enough to actually take the full force. It's it's fine. It goes it goes well, and it, it goes downhill like a, like a brick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's perfect. So, well, thanks a lot, Alex. Uh, I love the project. Uh, I think you've done a wonderful job with it, and I appreciate you sharing it with the Layback Bike Report. Oh, thank you. I hope it inspires someone else to just have a go. You know, you know, even if it's a rubbish bike, it's, it can just be your first one. So, yeah, I, I, and it's a lot of fun. And, you know, my kids loved it. Other kids in the neighborhood love it. So it's, it's, a, it's a fun project. Lovely. Thanks very much, Gary. All right. And there he is, uh, Alex. Welcome. Hello. How are you doing? Good, good. Thank you so much. I love that. Uh, I love Frank and what you did. Now, I, I think uh, before we leave, uh, for sure, we need to acknowledge that uh, beautiful orange streamlined uh, bike that you showed there. <laughs> uh, mysterious, though, it was. It's uh, it, it actually belongs to uh, one of uh, our guests today. Uh, do you want to bring Barney up uh, for a second, Lars? Uh, Barney, uh, that was your bike, apparently? <laughs> Yeah, that was my first um, serious racing bike. So it's a, a copy of a, a Velocraft Nocom that I built in plywood back in oh, 2007. Not yeah, that the, one. It was the orange one, actually. Yeah, <laughs> right, so. orange one, number 151. <laughs> Very nice. Well, okay, Barney, I didn't want this to go by without uh, properly acknowledging you because I know you probably would throw some sort of copyright restriction on us. If I didn't, <laughs> no, no, uh, the... the, the I joined Alex's group when he set it up and sent him over pictures of various yeah, I, I contraptions I've done. I read your document with interest about That's how it. to go about designing it. And and I I I kind of wish I'd gone for a lower design with the um the front wheel between your legs, because I think it probably would be more aerodynamic and faster. But yeah. I, I suppose if if I build another one, I'll probably I'll I'll aim for that level of quality, I think. Uh, it was a shame not to see you at the weekend's racing. Alex. Yeah, I, I was going to ask Alex if he had anticipated uh, making that trip. So, Barney, I'm going to say goodbye for now. We'll finish up with Alex. Thanks, pal. Uh, Alex, so you, uh, in fact, were not able to get to uh, no, the um, powered uh, race. Tell us what happened. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned in the video, we we actually we're car free, so we don't own a personal motor vehicle, and. Um, I rented an enterprise car club and got up on Sunday morning to find a text that said, your booking has changed. And I thought, oh, because well, I don't know if you guys know, but we're having a petrol crisis here. So you, you can't buy petrol. And um, 
basically I went to my email and the change they had made to my booking was just to cancel it about two hours before I needed the car. Um, and th there was nothing I could do. I'd even considered using my cargo bike to push to the front of the queue and use a five gallon sort of barrel to just buy petrol like that. But even if I'd done that, that it wouldn't have worked because Enterprise wouldn't have let me take the car. It's, uh, it was, I was gutted. Um, but yeah, that's, that, I suppose that's life. You'll, you'll have more chances, I'm sure. So. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. I'm going to thank you. Any final thoughts uh, before I let you go, Alex? No, no, just uh, just build stuff. It's fun. Uh, I haven't died yet, so uh, I, I, it's all right. It's, ha it's hanging together. Very good. Alex, a pleasure talking to you, meeting you, Lovely. and uh, we hope to see you again, pal. Cheers. Bye. Okay, take care. All right, folks, uh, let's move along to our uh, our Layback Back Report review segments. Uh, we've got a couple here from, uh, first of all, Peter Stahl, who's going to show you how to fold one of his linears uh, and put it into a Honda Odyssey. Lars, let's take a look. So I want to put this <clears throat> linear long wheelbase in this Honda Odyssey. And of course, it'll fit in a Honda Odyssey easily because it's car is much longer than the bike right but I checked the registration this is a this car is less than a year old and he doesn't want me to scratch anything and the middle seats they move forward some but they don't they don't uh, come out easily or they don't tip up like some do so it's gonna have to go up over the center of the console and he didn't want to scratch the console so he generously offered to put his dog's bed there don't let his dog see this video. But we will not need that because we have we have a better solution. So I'm going to take the seat off this bike, which is relatively easy. And then I'll put the pin back in here so I don't lose it. You can still find it when you get back to S26. Now I'm going to fold the back of the frame and the front of the frame without removing the wheels because basically I'm lazy. So I'm going to take the steering linkage off and traditionally when I take the steering linkage off in a video I throw it in the lawn. Safe, safe landing. <clears throat> now Fold the back of the frame. Oh, wait, I hang the chain on the chain hanger. Look, I remembered it this time. Fold the back of the frame. Fold the front of the frame. Put the bike in the car. retrieve the spring linkage, very important. And this end attaches to the fork, and this end of the flute tube with the holes attaches to the handlebar. See in this neat, loose, tight, loose, tight. That goes right under there. The seat can go right down here. And there's still room for two people in the back seat. So you don't even, you don't even, you could bring your bike without folding it all the way and still have four passengers. And like I said, he's from Massachusetts. Thank you. There we go. Thank you, Peter. And uh, I think we'll just jump right into the next uh, review here. Uh, and that's Joseph Janning from Germany talking about the Radical trailer and his automobiles. Lars? Today, I'd like to talk about trailers. Let me just finish this and I'll tell you more about this. Okay, so this is it.
Now, I'm not a big fan of uh, trailers with three-wheel um, uh, bicycles, um, mainly because uh, adding weight to the bike doesn't affect negatively in any way the stability of it. Um, in fact, I, I think that, that many uh, trikes or velomobiles actually ride better in certain ways uh, when they are loaded because they are just planted to the ground and it's, it's a different feel to it. But of course, there are reasons uh, to add a trailer um, and uh, uh, because of that, uh, it is good uh, to have the uh, possibility, at least, uh, to pull a trailer with a velomobile. And that's what uh, uh, this uh, bolt is for. Um, here is the uh, um, hitch mount uh, at the uh, DF velomobile. And I'll uh, explain a little bit more about that and uh, more about the trailer that I've been using on trikes and velomobiles for the past, I think, 12 years. Um, in this video. Here you see the hitch bowl uh, mount from the bike side uh, from a different angle uh, and this is uh, how uh, it will then be attached uh, to the bike. Um, these are uh, options I use on my trike, this is on my mountain bike. On the Velomobile however it's not that easy. Uh, you need a reinforcement uh, on the inside um, to uh, create uh, the stability because the shell is very thin. And here you see the added ring that is, has been laminated um, into the uh, sidewall as a reinforcement. And up there uh, you can see the hole that you've seen before. Unfortunately, it reduces the cargo space. Uh, here you see me uh, mounting uh, the trailer hitch. Now, the main reason to put a trailer on a velomobile is um, the shape of the storage space in a velomobile. You will have to fit all your luggage in uh, small bags and it should have a long um, and not too wide shape. Which of course is possible. Here you see my uh, first Quest uh, in 2010 uh, loaded with about 15 kilos of luggage on a two-week self-supported camping tour around Germany's north. Everything is inside. Now, what do you do when you have some bulky items that you cannot really put into that format? And that's what a trailer is good for on a velomobile. For those occasions when you have to transport something uh, bulky um, that you can't really fit inside the velomobile. Now, let's take a look at the trailer that I use. Uh, essentially, it is a duffel bag on wheels. So perfectly suited to transport luggage um, and for luggage to be transported inside. It doesn't take up much storage space and uh, is quickly assembled uh, fully as a trailer. Hooking up the trailer is easy. Uh, first fix the uh, steel rope, a security rope, then put the uh, hitch over the knob, push forward, and that's it. That's a secure connection. The reverse Pull back uh, this. Lift the uh, security cable. Done. Now, this is an example um, of something, a bulky item that you can hardly store in the Velomobile. It's a three person tent. Fits easily in the trailer. Or, for another uh, purpose, uh, this is a uh, uh, case of uh, water bottles. Uh, two of these cases uh, fit easily into the trailer, though you can uh, quickly reach the load limit of 40 kilos, which I recommend to keep. You see, um, a, a large errand run uh, can easily be done uh, with this trailer, and I've done that many times with the trailer. This trailer fits 100 meters of uh, storage, and I've uh, put a couple of things in there including that big tent, a number of sleeping bags, uh, mats, and what have you. Now, let's close this with a solid zipper, and you can uh, adjust it further with these uh, straps on top. You can also strap some things on, on here. Um, 
you see here, uh, there's two latches for um, a shoulder bag, a uh, shoulder strap, um, and uh, there's also a handle here and there um, to uh, carry. The radical cyclone also comes with uh, a rain cover. Put it over here and there, and in front here, it is secured. the toolbar. That's it. Another neat feature of this trailer is that you can uh, easily use it for hacking as well. Let me show you. I take the wheel off here and put it in the back position. Over here. Same on the other side. Here I have a trailer which I can use to go hiking. Now Radical will provide you with a special hiking hitch uh, which makes it much easier to uh, take this trailer along, um, which I don't have, but you can get it. Now let's see uh, the trailer. Uh, in action. Here's an old picture from 2008. Actually, I have been using this trailer since, I believe, 2006 or so. Um, and uh, I've been pulling it mostly with my trike, so I didn't have to use the rear rack on the trike. Uh, but sometimes I've combined rear rack uh, with uh, the Cyclone trailer. Here you see it uh, in another part of town. Uh, very nice. I've uh, used it to haul uh, the uh, bike of my granddaughter. And I've also discovered uh, that other people, like uh, Zuren here from Denmark, are using the trailer with 20-inch wheels. And that's what I'm doing now. Here you see um, my DF with the trailer uh, with 20-inch uh, front wheels from a Velomobile mounted to it, carrying about, I think, 25 kilos of malt, um, which we got from another part of Germany, um, to be used for beer brewing. And uh, I show you this uh, to demonstrate that you can go good speeds uh, with a loaded trailer uh, behind the Velomobile. The trailer will be very stable. Um, and uh, the, the weight in the trailer um, helps the uh, um, stability. But you should also be careful uh, when you uh, cross um, uh, rough roads and, and, and potholes. Uh, it will pull. Um, uh, at the back of the Velomobile quite substantially, and actually it's the same with the trike. You can really feel uh, the pull of, the tr of a loaded trailer. Uh, so a bit of caution is in order, but you see here riding at uh, uh, 35 plus kilometers an hour, uh, that is uh, what roadies do, and you do this uh, in a Velomobile with a loaded trailer. So I think uh, you can actually uh, also go touring. Um, with uh, such a trailer, like my friend Søren from uh, Denmark has done uh, a couple of times. Um, by the way, this other trailer is a, is a home-built version with 28-inch uh, uh, wheels. Uh, looks very, very uh, uh, different from, from mine. But yeah, my trailer, is, I think, is, is a pretty neat uh, addition um, uh, to the trike uh, and to the Velomobile. So I can recommend it from many years of experience. It's a well-designed, practical, and very durable uh, piece of equipment. If you want to know more, uh, go to RadicalDesign.com uh, on the web. Uh, they are based in the Netherlands. The Cyclone trailer um, in its current uh, improved version sells for around 550 euros. Uh, and on their site, they have all sorts of accessories and spare parts that you can order uh, with this trailer to uh, um, fit it to your precise needs. So much uh, from uh, Velomobile Wonderland on uh, trailers and travels. Uh, thank you for watching. And thank you, Joseph. That was wonderful. Uh, and uh, 
my good pal Marco Ropers, who actually lives in the Netherlands, I think that <laughs> I think that's the name of the town that uh, that Radical Designs in. I think that's what you mean by that, Marco. So thank you very much for that. Oh. Is that a correction? Maybe. In any case, there we go. Thanks, Marco. And thank you, Joseph, for uh, for that great review of the Radical Design trailer. All right, folks, let's uh, finish up here with our sponsors. And then we have a quick uh, viewer submission I want to show you. So here are the folks that make this show possible every month. First of all, TerraCycle. From fairings to headrests, whatever accessory you need, Pat and crew have you covered. And Trailside Trikes. If you find yourself in Florida, near the Withlacoochee Trail, or in Knoxville, Tennessee, check out Andrew's shop and his amazing crew. And Cruise Bike. Their patented race and record-proven front-wheel drive geometry changes the rules of cycling. Now, comfort doesn't come at the cost of performance. But fair warning, your cheeks may hurt from smiling. And Terra Trike and Green Speed Trikes. Your vision, whatever it is, Terra Trike has a trike to take you there. And Green Speed Cutting Edge Designs create performance through Aussie ingenuity. And Laid Back Cycles, the top USA dealer for Terra Trike and the premier source for Cat Trike, Ice, and Green Speed. We give you the freedom to ride. And Recumbent Cycle Con. We've postponed the 2021 Recumbent Cycle Con, but please join us on October 8th and 9th, 2022, at the Montgomery County Fairgrounds in Dayton, Ohio. More info at recumbentcyclecon.com. All right, folks, let me uh, share with you a submission that we got from uh, a viewer, John Bloomhagen. And John is an amazing fella who has undertaken a number of tours, uh, epic, long tours on his trike. Uh, and this latest one, which he just finished up a couple of weeks ago, uh, he called the Wi-Fi Peddlers 2021 Mission Possible Tour. So let me tell you what he said, and I'll give you some specifics. I think uh, you will appreciate the hard work that went into all this. Hey, Gary, I wasn't sure if you'd been following me, but just wanted to let you know that I did reach Alaska from Orlando on day 142, which was August 20th. Total mileage was 5,400 miles, and 700 miles of that was by ferry from Bellingham, Washington to Ketchikan, Alaska. I had to take that route because I could not get into Canada the third week of July when I was in Missoula, Montana, and visiting Adventure Cycling because Canada had shut down uh, the borders to any visitors. John. So, uh Great tour, John. Uh, I'm going to post uh, John's uh, link. It's uh, the Wi-Fi peddlers.com. I'll post that. And guys, he has blogged every day of this trip. Uh, and he's had lots of trials and tribulations, an amazing trip. Let me just finish up with some stats uh, that, uh, that John has supplied. Total days to Alaska from Orlando is 143. Total days that I rode from one destination to another, exactly 100. Days I rested, recovered, repaired, and presented, 43 days. Average miles per day that I rode was 47. Greatest distance in one day was 88.1 miles. He did that twice on day 41 and 86. Days I rode over 70 miles. There were 13 of those. Fastest average speed day was day 113. He averaged 10.4. And the greatest elevation gain day was day 63, 4,503 feet west to Council Bluffs, Iowa. So again, if you want to find out a lot more about John's journey and the amazing work that he and his wife Erlene do, check out uh, the Wi-Fi peddlers.com. And again, I'll post that. You can see it there. But uh we hope that you'll check him and Erlene out. And as a reminder, we love your submissions. If you'd like uh, to have me uh, read a, a bit about what you've been working on or where you've been going, uh, 
send us some pictures and a little paragraph or two about what it's about and send it to laidbackbikereport at gmail.com. And we'll see if we can't uh, get you on our future show. All right, folks, uh, next Laidback Bike Report will be November 7th at our typical 2 p.m. Eastern time and uh, working on a number of things again. So we'll leave that as a to be announced, but I think you'll enjoy that show. Again, if you'd like to support the Laidback Bike Report, we would greatly appreciate it if you would like us on Facebook. If you would subscribe to us on YouTube, if you would click that little white eye right there on the screen, uh, take you to the Laidback Bike Report uh, webpage. You can find out a lot more about what we have done, what's coming up, uh, lots of info there. Uh, and uh, you can also uh, join our Patreon there. Uh, you can see all these folks here that you see that I'm pointing to, our Patreon uh, supporters. We love them and we really appreciate their monthly support. You can do so for as little as a dollar a month. So check us out on uh, patreon.com uh, or uh, click on the links in the description below. You can take It will take you there as well. All right, uh, Lars, can we bring uh, all our panelists and guests, whoever we have left here? I want to thank everyone quickly. We had a great show. We really enjoyed that, guys. Thank you all so much for uh, helping out. Uh, I thought it went really well. Lots of interesting builds and interesting stories we even took to the air. And we took to the air while we were on the air, I guess. So uh, <laughs> thanks to all of my amazing guests uh, today. We appreciate your help and my panelists. Uh, we appreciate you, of course, every month. So thanks, guys. And finally, of course... I want to thank all of our wonderful viewers and our panelists, of course, uh, for watching us every month and supporting us in any way that you can. So until our next webcast from all of us here at the Laid Back Bike Report, so long, Bent Riders.